Good evening, everybody. Welcome to School Psych Podcast. My name is Rachel. I'm a school psychologist. I'm in Maryland and really excited tonight. I'm very nerdily uh, excited to be talking about LD and IQ and all the stuff also that's going on kind of around us in the school systems and in life and, and everything. So we've got an awesome guest tonight. But I'm going to toss it over to Rebecca, who's going to tell everybody about how you can participate tonight. Rebecca? Yes, hello everybody. If you are listening live tonight, please log into your Google account or your YouTube account and you can comment right next to the video, right next to the chat box. And if you are watching the recorded video later or listening to the audio on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts, please continue the conversation by asking questions or posting your comments, what, what you're thinking about tonight's episode and use the hashtag psyched podcast. You can do that on either of the Facebook pages, School Psyched, Your School Psychologist, or the School Psych Podcast page, or on Twitter, of course, using that hashtag. And even tonight, if you're feeling a little shy to comment in the live broadcast, in the live chat box, feel free. I'll be checking for notifications on our social media, too. So feel free to tweet or message us on Facebook. And now I'll hand it off to Eric. Hi, everybody. I'm Eric, and I'm a school psychologist also in the state of Connecticut. And I think we're all in the state of confusion right now with the pandemic. So um, we're all in this together. I hope everyone's doing well and I uh, hope we're continuing to check in on each other and uh, reach out and encourage one another through all of this stressful stuff. We're excited to have Dr. Stefan Dombrowski with us this evening. And we've been fans of his for quite a while and uh, enjoy some of the things that he's written and some of the uh, connections that we have through some of our other podcast guests. So I think this is a timely subject, especially given assessment questions and concerns, and then also given uh, some of the issues with LD assessment in general. So we're excited to have uh, Stefan's thoughts and uh, hear what he has to say tonight. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about him. Dr. Stefan Dombrowski is a professor and director of the graduate program in school psychology at Ryder University in Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Dr. Dombrowski's teaching and research focused on the promotion of evidence-based psychological assessment in school psychology via his interest in quantitative psychology, scientific decision-making and clinical judgment and measurement issues. He has also previously conducted research on prenatal exposures to teratogens in relation to later psychological, behavioral, and academic outcomes in children. Dr. Dombrowski has published five books and more than 100 articles and book chapters. He's a licensed psychologist and certified school psychologist and is an associate editor of the Journal of Psychoeducational Assessment and serves on editorial boards of several journals in school and assessment psychology. And he can be found online at stefandombrowski.com. And so, uh, Dr. Dombrowski, maybe if we start off talking about assessment in the pandemic, perhaps. Um, sure. what, what would be good? Yeah, yeah, terrific. Well, well, first of all, thank you, uh, Rachel, Eric, and Rebecca for having me um, on this, this is a wonderful um, uh, podcast. So um, I'll talk about just briefly uh, the assessment in the schools given the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is sort of an outgrowth. This discussion is a little bit of an outgrowth of um, some colleagues, Ryan Farmer, Ryan McGill, Nick Benson, um, and others uh, across the country. Uh, there, we have a impressed um, article that will be coming out any day now on this particular topic to offer guidance, more, more specific guidance to the field. I mean, I should say specific, it's actually general. And, you know, we're all fumbling our way through it. So you all as school psychologists and, and maybe uh, directors of special education have before you uh, for this year and then perhaps into the near term, um, the question of should we assess, should we evaluate children? We see um, Pearson suggesting that there are options available. So, so really the, the question is to test or not to test. Um, the Office of Civil Rights suggests delaying testing until schools reopen. And, and you've probably seen similar state uh, level guidance or state association guidance from different psychological agencies 
Now, uh, interestingly enough, the, the Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, uh, suggested that they're, they're, she's not going to provide waivers to districts um, for meeting their special education requirements. We don't know what bearing that will have on your psychological or psychoeducational assessment practice in and of itself. Um, so, but we do have various considerations. It, it, uh, I would recommend at this point in time, waiting until, and, and that's also in the paper, waiting until uh, school districts reopen um, for a number of reasons, and we can switch to the next slide, but one of which is training, training of itself. Have we been adequately trained in remote administration? Um, and, and one of the requirements, the prerequisites to conducting re remote assessment is to actually have trained proctors go into the home. I think that'd be a little bit dangerous uh, given stay at home orders and, and, and social distancing measures at this point. Um, we don't necessarily wanna have people going into, into a home wearing a space suit, et cetera. Um, so so that's, that's a logistical issue. Um, we can't have legal guardians proctor. There's a clear conflict of interest in that respect. And then additionally, what are some of the technological considerations? There's impediments to uh, platforms. Um, do we have iPads? Do Does the home have sufficient bandwidth? Um, and, and so on. And so we can move to the next slide. And we also have considerations, other considerations such as psychometric. Um, how can we adapt a test such as the WISC to be used remotely? Um, these tests, as well as, for instance, academic achievement tests, we they haven't been created for that purpose. We don't have the establishment of adequate reliability and validity for uh, use of these measures. There's been a white paper, so to speak. It's unpublished. Uh, there's an unpublished white paper where there's been some study looking at the, the RIAS and it's not the most rigorous of studies, but it does show that there is some equivalence. We need a lot more. We need your typical structural validity, your typical measurement invariance studies um, to, to properly utilize uh, at the very least IQ tests as well as uh, academic achievement. Um, other instruments that have been used um, remotely includes, there's some brief neuro, uh, neuropsychological measures and we've also, um, successfully conducted remotely um, behavior rating scales. Now, I'm not condemning all remote assessments. There could be some positives, particularly later on when we're beyond the pandemic. Um, there are underserved locations. We, we hear about the Navajo Nation, for instance, um, and not having necessarily health care, but the same thing applies to, to mental health and other, uh, not necessarily having sufficient um, uh, professionals so, so there, there may be some uses for that, but right now at present, we have a ways to go before it can be universally adopted in the schools. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. And I, I think one of the big considerations and, and, and so uh, social justice is, is something that is a topic that's, that's hot, so to speak. It's an important one, um, but, but like many topics goes through different waves. Um, but but it's legitimately a concern for remote uh, remote assessment. Do individuals, let's say there's there's economic injustice, do they have access to technology? Do they have sufficient internet speed? Is there an optimal environment for testing? Um, if the answer is no, that's a that's a huge problem. Um, similarly, and here's where measurement itself matters. Um, has there been established structural validity? Uh, research conducted as well as measurement invariance. Uh, these these studies are, are, are non-existent. And, and so with, with structural validity, that's just simply looking at, um, um, you, let's say you have the WISC, you have the 10 subtests WISC primary battery. You have the 10 subtests, they all ha are intercorrelated. So we can't think in 10 dimensional space. So we need to use a simple algorithm called factor analysis to kind of crunch that those correlation matrices down to something um, uh, more parsimonious. And 
it's when you conduct the factor analysis, it serves as the basis for um, how the instrument is scored and interpreted. So if you don't have established structural validity, then then how can you can you score these measures? And and the same thing with measurement invariance. How, measurement invariance just looks at um, how you can compare performance on the instrument across different groups, et cetera. So um, why don't we, I'll, I can take some questions from, from the panel, from Eric, Rebecca, or um, Rachel. I know that we had a viewer question just about advice for psychs out there, I think are being pressured to give a, assessments maybe when we're not sure, you know, what, what that's gonna look like or um, if that's the wisest thing to do right now. Do you have any advice for that? <laughs> yeah. Um, my initial reaction would be um, you may open yourself up for some litigation. That's off the cuff. Why would I say that? It's almost like, so I understand that there are timelines, you know, 60 days or so, and you have to be in compliance and that's important. Um, um, you have to think about the flip side. The flip side might be, um, if the tests that are being used are found to be lacking in reliability, validity, like lacking just fundamental psychometric properties, um, we're not going to remember necessarily three years from now that, oh, this was conducted during the COVID pandemic. We're going to remember, huh, were there some errors committed? Is this a quality report? Um, and so it's it's almost akin to rushing through an evaluation just to meet a timeline. I would rather um, be out of compliance, so to speak, by a few days, a few weeks, and have a well-conducted, properly written assessment than I would with rushing and having something sloppy. I mean, ideally, you do both in the time frame. Um, just to play devil's advocate, what if, um, I mean, on the flip side, if we're not testing kids, then we're not maybe setting up services or getting kids resources that maybe they would have access to if they did go through the testing process. And then another thing is, you know, if we're anticipating being back in the fall, that doesn't, pushing pushing testing off doesn't sound too bad. We don't really know when we're coming back. Say we come back in two years, you know, how, how long can you feasibly hold off on testing, I guess. Yeah, yeah I, I'd be surprised if it's two years, but but let's say we're back in the fall for a month, I would front load those evaluations. I understand it's, it's Sophie's choice, right? It's, it's um, uh, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't in some respects. Um, and so it's a tough decision. Um, we're fumbling our way through it right now. Um, I would err on the side of following the guidance from the, the office of civil rights and let's say, and let's see what additional guidance comes out. Um, you know, I, I do, you know, it could, in fact, um, I, I think Ryan McGill has chimed in here. Um, you know, could we be opening a Pandora's box with premature adoption? Maybe. Uh, uh, w might we be recapitulating the use of, of assessment instruments that, that didn't have sound psychometrics and then opening up issues for later litigation, et cetera? Um, so, but you raised the question of, of, you know, will kids not be able to have access? Maybe you can provide them with access and then um, I, you know, this, this is tough. I'm fumbling around here. It's, uh, maybe provide them with the access of other data points other than a standardized assessment. If you, if you, if you absolutely need it to rule out intellectual disability, et cetera, um, then, then I don't see that there's necessarily a way around it, except using your clinical judgment. Um, you may have to invoke what, what many suggest is, is clinical judgment in, in these matters. Um, so, but I, I'd be wary about jumping in, uh, especially when, when, when the Office of Civil Rights and other state school psychology um, associations are saying delay for, for the time being. That may change, but, but we still have a lot of questions about the 
these remote assessment instruments. And I don't think that we have necessarily the, the capabilities um, at this point in time. We, we had a viewer question that um, he wonders, can you speak to the impact that COVID-induced trauma will have on overall assessment and eligibility determination? And I also wonder, um, related to that, I've seen um, some professors sharing self-report measures on uh, trauma and stress and anxiety impact of COVID for, um, for re-entry. Do you think that's the kind of assessment we should be looking looking to, to start? It could be in the form of, uh, you know, screening for it, almost your, your crisis intervention type of um, uh, approach itself. I mean, these are unknowns. We don't know how children are going to necessarily respond. I mean, there does seem to be an uptick in, in um, mental health issues itself. So, so I, I think um, folks need to be school psychologists and others need to be vigilant about these matters, absolutely. Uh, and I, I think we also have to be aware of self-care for those uh, working in the schools. I mean, we have this backlog of assessments and then other pressing mental health needs, um, yet at a time period where state governments are being financially decimated, you know, how are we going to provide all these services? Will there be cuts? Um, so I think school psychologists in particular, and this is sort of off topic, but that's fine, have to be aware of burnout, their own self-care. We see that with respect to the healthcare workers. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if there'll be a, a second wave of, um, of you know, I'm speaking more about the healthcare professionals, a second wave of, of a trauma reaction by school psychologists and other folks working in the skill, schools. Um, that, that's something we have to be worried about as well as the students who we uh, care for. I agree. Um, I wonder also, you know, we're talking about measurement. Uh, I, I think all of these variables are so impactful. So um, the, the mental health issues, the trauma issues, the ability for us to assess, um, but thinking about um, variants and construct irrelevant variants and, and the whole um, way that tests are developed and the way that we'd be administering them differently. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah. Um, well, it introduces a greater possibility for error itself. Um, you know, how well-trained is the proctor? What is the environment like? Um, and so on. What happens if there are glitches? What does the instrument itself look like, a remote instrument? We can't simply necessarily have someone just manipulate the block design that that's difficult so yeah sure certainly these are issues that absolutely need to be studied and i don't have the answers for them because this is this is novel territory um i i i think that that in, in terms of telehealth um you know counseling we can do that a little bit more readily assessments different we we need more we need to learn more about it uh, especially before we necessarily uh, adopt it um, wholesale. I, I mean, if we're out as Rebecca, uh, Rachel indicated for two years, then, then 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 I don't think that's likely. We'll probably have waves of of opening up, closing down. Um, then then we'll have to improvise. We'll have to go in a certain direction itself. Yeah. So. It's, everything's just so up in the air. Um, I don't think Absolutely. Is. You know, and so we should have imminently, as I mentioned, Ryan Farmer, McGill, Ryan McGill, uh, other colleagues and I have a um, paper discussing some of these is issues and, and, and really raising questions. Um, and, and the answer comes down to at least with assessment itself, you know, do we or do we not? There are two paths forward. Um, ultimately, I think the decision that has to be made is, if we have data that suggests that a child needs services, then then maybe we have to go in that direction. And maybe the maybe the question is, oh gosh, we shouldn't uh, determine whether or not remote assessment is actually valid and reliable. But but let's get the kid support that the, that the child needs. Um, and so we'll have to be perhaps a little bit creative with caveats, et cetera, if that child needs that 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 support.
Yeah, and my district you know, has been looking into, um, you know, what, what, if we need to do this, how, how are we going to do it? And like you said, the technology alone, you know, it's not just a matter of this person has an iPad and you have an iPad. You know, there's we found that our, our laptops aren't necessarily able to sync up with our iPads to do it remotely. And then there's just all these all these technical things that, that we've looked at Pearson and that looks really kind of difficult to yeah. take it out. I've heard that. I mean, there's just it's. It's, it's difficult. And there, there is a study looking at Q Global and, and, and doing assessment um, remotely that way. And, and the results, I mean, it's Kathleen Crack at Florida State, one of the few studies. And it's, um, and it's not very, uh, not, not necessarily positive toward um, a remote assessment. So we'll probably move in that direction at some point, but, but, but the psychometrics are just not there at this point in time. I know we've got some other questions popping up, so sorry, <laughs> pardon us as we're kind of fielding everything, but um, let's see, it seems like there's been a special ed parent group who have expressed their wish that evaluations be conducted without delay. How would you suggest you respond, that they respond to their concern? Interesting. Um, I, I would definitely speak to your district's special education, your district's attorney. I would defer to that individual. Um, you know, because uh, again, there's there, there hasn't been necessarily guidance from um, state departments of special education. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we have a, there, there's some more in depth information coming out in a paper that was submitted. We can't really move into that um, in, in full detail, but but I, I want to be cautious about getting into sort of offering specific legal advice. Um, so I would defer that question to the, the special education uh, attorney um, at that district. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if we want to move on to sort of, hey, let's think about learning disabilities assessment. And we know that um, uh, you know, districts are still using the IQ achievement discrepancy. They're, they may be using PSW. Um, let's take a look at another particular model itself that preceded the DSM. Um, and I can give you more precise, detailed information about this because we have more literature. So, to speak. Um, so, so moving on, moving away from COVID, and I, I felt that that it might just be important to take a stab at it knowing that we're all in this together, fumbling our way toward answers. Um, same thing with learning disabilities assessment itself. So the literature suggests casting aside the IQ achievement discrepancy, as well as processing strengths and weaknesses. I'm not gonna go into necessarily the, the scientific support for doing so. Um, it's numerous. Uh, you, you can read Aaron, 1997. There's an article that talks about the demise of the discrepancy. You can read um, McGill Dombrowski Canavay, uh, a 2018 Journal of School Psychology article that talks about reasons for not using PSW. Um, in essence, it's nothing more than a coin flip. That's what the diagnostic treatment utility suggests. Now, here's a dilemma that people face, right? That practitioners face, that school psychologists working in the schools. And this is something that that I continue to work with 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 school districts for the past uh, for o over 18 years. I'm no longer doing that anymore. One job sufficient. Um, but you, you see these procedures codified in federal and state regulations. So people often say, well, boy, we should be able to use them. Right. Well, I would suggest that that science itself um, lags behind um excuse me, uh, law lags behind science by quite some time. We see this with the IQ achievement discrepancy model. We know that, that and this gets at sort of errors in, in judgment, critical thinking. Um, we have Sir Michael Rutter, whose Isle of Wight study was one of the first to provide evidence for the IQ achievement discrepancy approach. And this, this was a distinguished individual, an eminent scientist. And so 
um, part of his research contributed to the codification of the IQ achievement discrepancy model in our federal re regulations and subsequently state regulations. Unfortunately, um, most of the research that came after that essentially rebuked the IQ achievement discrepancy model as a valid and reliable uh, model in and of itself. And, and, and again, when we, when we conduct assessments for learning, um, we, we, we don't just rest upon a specific algorithm, but, but it, it, it has been over the decades significantly influential. Um, same thing with PSW. It, uh, it, it, as I mentioned, it doesn't have um, any greater, it's no greater than a coin flip in determining whether or not um, an individual manifests a learning disability. I'm not going to talk about RTI, I'll talk about it in a moment, but, but not that uh, much. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so I know that, that people, when others have come on and talked about, well, what are we to do with IQ? Uh, we're not to do PSW, where we really ought not utilize it um, as part of the LD assessment. Um, and so this may be scary for folks, but it shouldn't be because, because IQ is really used um, as an essential part of intellectual disability assessment and maybe, maybe learning disabilities. Um, it, it should, so in essence, IQ should be used to singularly rule out intellectual disability. It'll give you a sense of a child's educational trajectory. We know that a child that scores a 75 will likely struggle more so than a child that's, that scores a 105 on an IQ test. And these are, these are probabilistic, not deterministic. Um, but, but IQ does, it, it's, it's a construct in psychology that is the most research construct in all of psychology, um, for good reason. It's, it is, it's a real construct and it is linked to not only educational success, but also it's correlated with vocational success as well. Um, so we're not, I'm, I'm saying with respect to LD assessment, we're not going to use it. We're not going to use the IQ achievement discrepancy. We're not going to do PSW, but we'll still use IQ tests. We're going to change how they're used. I, I still think that an IQ test, albeit a briefer one, um, is useful for the information that you see on this slide to rule out intellectual disability and just to get a sense of how a child is performing. Um, it's changed perceptions of children. I've done evaluations where where teachers thought the kid really, really uh, maybe didn't, um, uh, wasn't as bright as he or she was. And then you administer an IQ test and, and, and wow, the child's brighter than, than, than thought. And, and, and it opens the eyes to, to, um, to the child's capabilities. So, um, so we're going to change how they're used. We're not going to get into the nitty gritty subtest analysis cognitive profile analyses, and that's been discussed previously on the podcast. Um, Question. Um, so when you're saying, you know, it can be used to obviously rule out um, intellectual disability. I've seen psychs that um, for use it for that purpose with every eval. Are you, does every kid need an eval during LD to rule that out? Or can that be also done through like record review or the fact that like, nobody has concerns for ID or clearly the adaptives are where they need to be? Yeah, so um, I like to include an IQ test in any comprehensive evaluation that I do for the very reason that um, if we get outside of our little world of school psychology and you get into the world of the courts, um, it, it'll, whether it's an antiquitum sort of fallacy, um, you know, just doing something for the sake of doing because it, it was done in the past or not, um, um, it's, I, I think it completes an evaluation. I, I think that, that IQ in and of itself is an important construct that tells us about an individual. Um, and, and so I do think, I, I think it's worthwhile, at least initially. Uh, I, I, I don't know that we, we can infer, we can make guesses doing data review, record review, uh, looking at their achievement tests. I mean, achievement and IQ are, are, 
correlated, and, and I know generally it's thought about 0.6, but I but if you look at the WISC, like for instance, the WISC four, the data that just comes to my mind, and the Wyatt, um, the, the current version of the Wyatt, it's like 0.83, which is an equivalent correlation of the WISC with, with another IQ test. So yeah, you can use that as a proxy, but IQ is a different construct than it, or attribute than achievement. And so I think it, I think it, it provides important information and rounds out an evaluation. Um, so makes sense. Kind of sort of sort of kind of. Yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah. um, so what to utilize? I mean, you do have in um, the federal regulations, alternative research base. Now, you know, we throw around the buzzwords of research base um, approaches. Um, does that mean something that's published? Does that mean something that appears in a book, in a, in a presentation? You know, it's loosely defined. Um, but at the risk of being a little bit self-promoting, I'm going to show you a functional diagnostic LD classification approach that's been around for 16 years. Um, and it's based upon, uh, it actually it precedes the DSM and it's roughly equivalent to it, ironically enough. Um, and so it is the, what, what Randy Camphouse, Cecil Reynolds and I coined the, uh, the dual deficit functional impair academic impairment model. Um, and it's quite parsimonious. It says, utilize a norm reference academic achievement measure. Um, that's criteria number one. Do we, do we have a deficit in that area? Um, I don't know if the slide's too small when you're looking at it or not. Um, and, and so we might select a cut score on that of about 85, give or take the standard error measure. You, you, can, you can move that a little bit. Um, it could be an 80. It depends upon the local norm. Um, but incorporate the standard error measure. So that's the one prong. The other is um, an academic deficit as evidenced by it could be grades, teacher ratings of academic performance if grades are not furnished, high stakes testing, or CBM scores, which are sort of the in some respects, the technology of, of RTI. Um, and again, you can set a particular cut score there. So, so, you're, you, so there's a requirement of a dual deficit. It's, it's different. It's, it's similar in some respects to intellectual disability. We have a, a dual deficit in IQ and adaptive behavior, but it's different as well. Um, you, you have a standardized achievement test, and then you have an academic deficit. So people might suggest well, what do you do with RTI? Well, there are models. There's various models of RTI. Some of which say, hey, at the end, when the child fails to respond to intervention, then we utilize a comprehensive psychoeducational assessment. So um, where does IQ come into play? We don't look, we don't have need necessarily for a um, disorder, uh, a disorder processing. It's not a required element. Um, and I think that IQ tests are used to um, rule out intellectual disability. Um, and that's, that's their sort of purpose. And so you have the other aspects, diagnosis by age 18. Uh, and I would even consider at, at some point in the next federal regulations, moving away from the whole construct of learning disabilities. Let's get into uh, developmental learning delay. Um, let's distance ourselves from the construct of LD, which has been intensely debated um, over the past decades itself. So, um, you know, I have another, the next slide is another uh, kind of flow chart, so to speak, but it's the same thing. It pops up. Um, and if not, that's okay. Sorry, I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing, but it's another slide, just kind of, um, you know, a little pretty graphic there. Um, 
but yeah, it's pretty parsimonious and, um, you know, it hasn't necessarily been empirically validated, but honestly, it's going to capture the kids that fall through the cracks. If in districts that don't necessarily utilize RTI, they're adhering to rigid sort of IQ achievement discrepancy models, or they're flipping a coin and using a PSW approach. Um, this is going to, it's functionally related. The kids struggling, struggling on a norm reference achievement test. The kids struggling in the classroom. I mean, obviously the kid's not going to be referred unless they're struggling. And so let's see how they're doing now. Now, why a nationally norm referenced achievement test? Um, because we need a standardized sort of nomenclature, sort of diagnostic algorithm. We can't just have idiosyncratic um, diagnostic approach. Otherwise, what's the point of classification? So I, I need to know that 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 someone who's classifying or diagnosing LD in Connecticut is is using the same model as someone in California, Texas, New York, Virginia. Um, classification itself communicates. And if we don't have a proper definition of a construct, then why even bother uh, diagnosing? Um, so, so it keeps it fairly simple. It's straightforward. You can, you can move the cut score a little bit, but at least you know um, what to do in the, in, in the case of LD assessment. And um, if you look at the DSM, it's very similar. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Stefan, uh, just to jump in for a second. Um, I think that's been one of our problems with LD is that the construct has been defined so differently over the last few decades that we've struggled to, to measure it because we we're starting with a poor definition in the first place. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, before you can measure something, you need to define it, operationally define it. And we've had disagreement about this particular construct. And the irony, LD assessment itself is um, one of the most prevalent activities of school psychologists, right? It encompasses about 50% of our special education uh, classifications. And it's idiosyncratically defined in part because it's um, a political definition, um, in part because we have these algorithms out there, PSW, cross-battery assessment. They're money makers. They're money makers for test publishing companies and the people that develop them. So if we look at some of these PSW models and you look at the evidence on them, and I know another speakers have talked about that, but, but it's you have citations within citations. They've never been vetted in the peer reviewed literature or if they have, or, or, or rarely, I should say, I have to be, be cautious about saying never, rarely have been vetted. But um, when it has been vetted, it's been found to be sometimes even worse than a coin flip. Um, so, you know, this at least is gonna capture the kids who might fall through the crack. Um, or if you want to use, in the case of PSW and doing your subtest analysis, if you want to use that approach, then, um, you know, throw it, give your kids in the school, have, give them a dart and have them throw it at a red or white piece of paper and then turn it over. Do they have LD or not? That's essentially what you're doing. Um, so. So the question is, would this method artificially classify more students in lower SAS areas? So we don't have a rigid cut score. And I mentioned about, about shifting that um, to account for local norms itself. Um, now, yeah, there's some arbitrariness. We're not rigid about that, but, but, but you can, there is some, some flexibility in that respect. And, and so you may get into a situation where you go from, um, um, Appalachia, for instance, and then move to uh, Newport, California, and whereas a child, uh, um, you know, may not qualify in one district and may qualify in the other, you're still going to have that. And so, so ultimately, it's not just one algorithm using clinical clinical judgments. Um, so, your your clinical judgment is part of this. There's multiple sources of data, uh, et cetera, when when it comes to learning disabilities assessment of itself. 
So there, there is that sort of um, factor, you know, there, maybe it's an 80. Um, when, when I, when I worked and, and I utilized this in a, um, 98% free and reduced lunch school, I would use a, an 80 as the cut score. And then the director of special education looked at the decades and she's like, wow, isn't this really interesting? When I look at the, the PSSA scores was in Pennsylvania, um, this method actually captured the kids that were struggling on the PSSAs and what the teachers had suggested we're struggling. There was, you know, so it was an improvement. I was like, well, that makes sense because we're, it's very functional. We're looking at, at how the kids are doing on norm reference achievement tests, et cetera. Um, and, and state level achievement tests. So I think that's a big deal. I, I don't think we consider our local norms often enough. Um, when we're doing, you know, record reviews, perhaps, um, especially if we were just focusing, which we did it at one point on that, um, either the PSW or the IQ achievement discrepancy, um, we ignore that piece. And I think the local norms are important. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Um, so there's a question. I don't know if this was a while ago or not, but there's a question about, um, are there cases where staff teachers see a low IQ and then discount a kid? Absolutely. I mean, there are, we know the literature about self-fulfilling prophecies. We know the literature about kids who were blue-eyed versus the brown-eyed kids. And they were told that blue-eyed individuals are superior, smarter. They start living up to those expectations, whereas the children with, with brown eyes um, uh, start living down. So, so absolutely. That's the, the, from a sociological perspective, perspective. Um, it's absolutely the case, and which is why I always tell my students when they're practicing IQ testing, don't give it to your significant others, your younger sister, try to find someone else uh, where there's not a conflict of interest, right? Because you don't want to change your perception. Actually, decide that they're not going to get married to, to her fiance <laughs> as a result of that. So uh, That's funny. Um, I, I, I tested him um, and now he's my husband, but he yeah. was my boyfriend at the time. <laughs> when yeah, <grad> yeah. <laughs> but, um, sure. That does make, you know, because uh, I typically don't, um, unless, you know, it's, it's if it's required, um, it is yeah. in the district to do an IQ with an LD eval, but normally I don't give an IQ as part of a eval unless, it, unless it's required or, you know, ID type of thing. And that's kind of been some of my reasoning that, one, it's not going to change how we're instructing the child generally. We still know they need this particular evidence-based reading instruction or whatever yeah. it is. Um, and I do worry about kind of that self-fulfilling prophecy. So, you know, I might tell a teacher, you might want to know the IQ. If it comes out to be an 80, like, okay, how are we going to do anything differently than if it comes out to be a 110? I'm not sure that it changes the instruction that they need. And I fear that, you know, the kid that comes down, you know, with a 75 or an 80 or something out of the average range that the that this teacher is going to, you know, um, maybe handle the kid um, a little bit Different could be. maybe they shouldn't. It could be, but it also could increase compassion and understanding regarding a child. So I, I can recall doing an evaluation and seeing a kid who was an extreme preemie, um, born at 25 weeks. And so the, teach, the school district didn't know about that. They didn't know. And, it, and, it, and the child was bouncing off, you know, bouncing all over the place, severe case of ADHD. And so just knowing that information increased compassion, you know, understanding of the child and the, and the plight of the child. And I think the same thing, if, if a child, uh, you do have the self-fulfilling prophecy, but you also have a recognition that, that maybe um, the child's trying and maybe struggling. And so, it, it, you know, I, I do think folks in the schools are compassionate, um, caring individuals. And so it, um, it, it, it may provide a different perspective on the child that, hey, they're not just learning reluctant, so to speak. They're they're working on all cylinders. So I, I'm sort of an old school believer in in having IQ as part of evaluation. I understand that people have different perspectives. And I'm not saying do a full-fledged total 16. So, I mean, I, I'm not going to espouse one instrument or the other, but, but it can be completed in a four subtest, six, subtest uh, uh, a battery. I mean, you know, like the RIAS 2, for instance, you can get that information. Um, so 
Yeah. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions. I don't know if you want to keep going or do you want to take some of these questions that I can ask? Um, doesn't matter. Let's see. What do we have here? Oh, so someone raised the question about the difference between the dual deficit functional academic impairment versus the DDC model. So DDC model is a DSW approach where you're looking at ipsative strengths and weaknesses. And if you don't manifest that, then you're not going to be eligible. Um, so highs, lows in a particular profile. This is just old wine repackaged under a new label, right? We have back with uh, McDoomit, I mean, gluting Phantasm, McDermott, just say no to subtest analysis. This in some respects is uh, old wine repackaged under a new label. And, and um, those profiles are not substantiated. And in fact, even subtest analysis itself, that, that goes back to the 40s, Rappaport, uh, 1946 had this two volume, thick two volume profile analytic textbook and, and uh, IQ tests um, over the decades have been inappropriately used, not only uh, to screen military recruits. Um, uh, well, that maybe that was appropriate. I mean, I mean, why was it adopt? Why were IQ tests adopted in this country in the first place? Well, the military loved them. Um, why the military loved them during World War II? Because it, it stratified really nicely. The generals fell out at the top, followed by the um, the colonels, followed by the lieutenants, majors, and so on down the ranks. Um, but we, uh, I'm going to diverge here, but but they were subsequently used inappropriately. They were used inappropriately to racially profile. We have groups from Russia, from Italy that were thought to be genetically, intellectually inferior, which is completely absurd uh, given the Roman Empire, given the Russian Empire, um, and so on. And those from the Balkan states as well. Uh, they're inferior to, to, to Northern European, et cetera. Uh, who was coming into this country at that time? It weren't, it weren't the nobility. I mean, people emigrating to this country were, were coming here for a better life. They're coming from impoverished areas. They, they didn't have formal education. Um, and proper nutrition. So yeah, they're going to, and even the language and access to the culture. So of course they're going to score lower, but, uh, but the inappropriate use of IQ tests didn't just stop there. I mean, it went on into the forties and fifties where David Wexler himself and, and on the basis of Rappaport used it to classify psychiatric diagnoses, schizophrenia, mania, uh, depression, and using profile analyses. Uh, that was debunked. Uh, then we moved into the 80s with the WISC-3 and the Freedom from Distractibility Index, right? Trying to corner the market. So, you know, we, we had ADHD was the rage. It was found under every rock, just like, you know, people had suggested that, that we see an increased uptick in autism being diagnosed. And I'm not saying they're not real, real constructs, but, but we jump around in our field from hot topics to hot topics. So the Freedom from Distractibility Index um, Psychorp, then Psychorp, which published the WISC, tried to corner the market and say, hey, this might be useful for classification of ADHD. Um, okay, we found that it wasn't. Then we move into the WISC-4, and wow, the factor structure of that instrument was actually, you know, independent research suggests, yeah, it's a four-factor instrument. Great. Terrific. Uh, then along came um, this whole PSW stuff. And lots, there's been subsequent research that says it doesn't work. It's no greater than a coin flip. This is nothing more than, uh, as we, as McGill and Canavay and I suggest, cognitive profile analysis 2.0, old wine repackaged under a new label. Um, we're still trying to discern these profiles. Um, why do we do that? I, I mean, it's... We, our brains are organized in a way to try to understand patterns, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think we end up doing a lot of this stuff retrospectively. I find out about the person, I go back and I seek a pattern um, to try to then make sense of the child, him or herself. Um, go in, I mean, if you want to do, an, so, so when we do these profiles prospectively, if I say, hey, give me these profiles, I'm going without knowing the child. I'm going to take a sample of a hundred and uh, or a thousand, even better, and I'm going to pick out who has an LD from the different profiles and who doesn't. 
it's 50 50 if you do it at a time well in retrospect if you do it oh that makes sense you're they're low in this and low in that and, and whatever it may be and there's all sorts go i mean look at sattler's text right um good text by the way but that that subtest analysis that has got to go i mean that, is, that that's an absolute dinosaur of a practice and that's taken our field down an absolute dead end um you know the rest of it's a good yeah it's a good book um, and I say that with a conflict of interest. I read a book on psychoeducational assessment and report writing. Second edition is coming out, but um, but but legitimately, Marley Watkins has. If you want to you want to read some great uh, resources on that, along with McGill's uh, a paper, go to that. Um, but but you know, listen. Um, IQ testing and 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 LD assessment. I mean the. This sort of stuff. I mean, it's right. It's intertwined with 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 LD assessment in many cases, and and um, y you know, th there's money to be made, right, with these sort of things. And I'm not saying people are setting out to deceive. Um, there's there's much good and human well being that has come from our assessment instruments, but when you look at test publishers and their um, the manuals, and you look at they're not citing um, literature, articles that don't comport with their way of thinking about the structure of an instrument. Um, that's a problem. That's disingenuous, unfortunately, and it's it's anti-scientific. I don't I don't know what else to, to call that when you just cite one side um, of, of the literature itself. So I'm, I'm speaking in which probably sounds like puzzles to, to you all, but, but, but there's, you can read uh, research by Watkins, Canavay, McGill, myself. At the end of this, I have my website up. Just click on some of those uh, links and then see what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, we've had, like you said before, we've had Dr. McGill on twice yeah, to talk yeah, about some of yeah. this. We've had Dr. Canavay on and Dr. Farmer. And so I think that it all kind yeah. of intertwines with what they're saying. Yeah. So I'd encourage people to watch them, too, to get um, yeah. more information on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and so, I mean, we can flip to the next side. We don't have too much time left, but this could be a topic for um, another day. But but why do these practices that lack an evidentiary basis persist? Um, I, I think that the marketing power of a test publisher sending out folks in workshops and presentations just um, overshadows, you know, the scientific literature. Um, and that's, that's understandable. So if something appears in the communique as an advertorial, we're reaching a broader audience than, let's say, a structural validity article that questions the factor structure of the Woodcock Johnson and suggests that it doesn't link up with CHC theory, right? Um, and, and a lot of this is obviously promoted by folks with a conflict of interest. Um, there's a financial conflict of interest. Um, and that that that's a problem. And I, I don't think that our field has sufficient oversight. Yeah, we have the test standards, but so what? You know, um, we we need greater oversight in our field for um, our assessment, uh, our tests, um, and so and so. So why else? Because people suggest, oh, it's legal. It's in. I mean, I, you look at something like the CSEP. There's some sort of LD approach that emerged out of Texas. I, I don't remember what it stands for, but I mean, the people say, well, it's it's legal. It's in the law, so therefore it must be scientifically proper and that's not the case um but 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 i think that 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 unfortunately school psychology and and, and any science it's not just school psychology it's any any science to be fair any scientific medicine nursing it's anywhere um we we don't necessarily what recognize the warning signs of pseudoscience in both assessment and intervention practices right we we, we don't we don't uh um look toward that. And I don't know if we have time to get into it, but I can talk somewhat about it, I suppose. Um, you can flip to the next, next slide itself. 
So, um, you know, one of the one of the markers of um, pseudoscience is a lack of falsifiability and ad hoc hypotheses. Um, and, and, and and this happens a lot of times in some of the research. We find that that um, an IQ test doesn't measure what it claims to measure the CHC factors. And then people use statistical manipulation and come up with all sorts of post hoc um, hypotheses about why it hasn't, and then they um, tinker, et cetera. That's that's not very scientific. Um, and it's the same thing that happens with respect to different profile analyses. And then we move to lack of self correction. That's not very interesting. It's just we we know thirty years of of literature debunking the discrepancy and we still don't we, we still see districts that are using it um confirmation versus refutation so there are numerous research studies and iq test technical manuals that use cfa procedures confirmatory factor analytic procedures to as a means to investigate iq tests um, there's nothing wrong with that methodology it's powerful um, when it's used appropriately but um but we shouldn't necessarily um, um, we shouldn't necessarily just rely upon that. Um, we need to come at it a priori with a particular structure, and then go out and, and, and test that. Not come up with a structure and, and seek and tinker and manipulate to 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 arrive at the particular structure. And, and another issue is. Um, uh, evasion of peer review. Take a look at the sources when a practice is promoted. Um, is it a workshop, a presentation, or has it been vetted in the peer reviewed process? And I'm not saying that that the peer reviewed process is infallible, but at least it gives you some sort of um, oversight um, on the, uh, as to the science. And, and not all not all research is the same. Some some journals are better than others. Some peer review process is better than others, but um, but it gives you uh, s some additional um, information. Um, so anecdotal evidence. This is testimonials, et cetera. And maybe we can move to the next slide. Um, hyper. This this one's good too. You might have these brain-based learning approaches where people are using hyper-technical neurobabble, psychobabble, linking this with the, uh, with the, you know, oh, look at this. The reading disabilities are linked to the corpus callosum. And, and in children with dyslexia, the corpus callosum is um, reduced in size and the plenum temporal is actually symmetrical when most cases left is greater than right, blah, 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 blah. Um, if you speak to a neurologist um, um, about many of these things, they, 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 they still wonder how can you get at necessarily uh, some of these diagnoses um, through these assessment instruments. So just be wary of, 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 of an intervention or assessment approach with, with, with this excessive hyper-technical language. Um, and, and be wary of... Um, when someone's promoting something and then the, they reverse the burden of proof. Um, they demand from those who are critiquing to then substantiate their position more so than they have. Um, so anyway, uh, what else do we have? Okay, yeah, go on to the next one if you don't mind, next slide. So extensive appeals to authority or gurus, eminence-based assessment. Wow, we have a lot of them out there, right? And they're getting keynote speeches and so on. Maybe they've created test assessment instruments and gone around and done a lot of uh, presentations. That's great. Maybe they're an authority, but give me the data. Um, still need to utilize uh, data. Same thing, that's, that's linked to heavy reliance on endorsements for Zoom experts. Um, and then what about, you know, again, this is wrapped up in the tenant, you know, what about insulation from criticism? And then that comes at, let's not even report the limitations of an approach or let's not report 
um, contrary research itself. So, um, you know, all right. So anyway, um, I'm going to be self-promoting here, complete conflict of interest, but, but I, I wrote this book not to make money, um, just to hopefully move the field forward. Um, I have a chapter, chapter two in the forthcoming, the second edition, the first edition has been out for a bunch of years, talks about a evidence-based psychoeducational assessment framework. It's interesting, puts it all together, and it talks about many of these issues. Um, and I'm also happy to, if anyone has qu questions, um, you can, you, you know, certainly email them to me and I'll attempt to, to address them, so. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's about um, a we had somebody who wanted an example of, um, <laughs> um, I guess, an eminence-based. So, eminence-based assessment would be um, Sir Michael Rudder. You know, anyone that has a sir before their name, you know, so certainly distinguished, right? Um, and so that individual, you know, suggested that, that the discrepancy was a viable, IQ achievement discrepancy was a viable model because of the stature of that individual research wise, uh, in particular, it was just sort of accepted and, and for quite some time without even, um, um, without even debating it. There's a second very good one. Uh, Alan Kaufman used the um, subtest specific variance as a means to um, interpret at subtest level. And he cited a 1959 Cohen research article, one of the first factor analytic articles of the WISC. Um, and it wasn't cited properly. And, and, and that practice perpetuated, and even up through, I think, a 2000 book, Kaufman and Lichtenberger. You know, he's a distinguished individual, Alan Kaufman. He's done some, some good for our field in terms of his IQ test. Um, but that Ipsit of approach, the scientifically astute decision-making took us down a blind alley. Um, and so people might say, well, you know, the distinguished Alan Kaufman suggests that we should engage in this practice. Yeah, there's a conflict of interest. He's selling IQ tests. Um, and, and, and I'll cast it in the, the era, of course, in all fairness to him. But we need to consider the data. Um, and not just the testimony of an expert. That's that's what I mean by eminence-based. You know, it's great. Um, you're regarded, but let's look at the data and and constantly. And it and it gets at what what Carl Sagan talks about: keeping an open mind on the one hand, um, but being skeptical, but having a balance between the two. We can't just be open to everything. Otherwise, we're not going to we'll be sitting around, you know, navel gazing. Um, but uh, but we also can't be cynical and overly critical. So it's a balance um, and so on. So. Awesome. Um, I'm gonna yeah. ask for last minute questions from anybody watching. Um, we had some good comments here from Dr. McGill. Um, so I'll read this out, I guess, for anybody listening. Um, through uh, iTunes and whatnot. So as an example, according to a popular district PSW man model manual, it is suggested that a weakness in GLR is the best predictor of a math difficulty. Our analyses uh, indicated it was. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, first of all, it, it's difficult to even uncover GLR on an IQ test. It doesn't, so we don't even have the, the, the psychometric foundation on many IQ tests for even that factor. I mean, it, the, the subtest, in other words, the subtest will load with something entirely different. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's the problem. You need structural validity. You need the subtest to align with the factors on the instrument before you can even interpret it. If you don't even have that, then don't even pass go. Don't even move forward. Don't use PSW. Don't use, um, well, you shouldn't be using subtest analysis, but don't even, or don't even, don't even interpret at the, the index level. Um, the it's thing not. is that it's so pervasive in our field and yeah. um, just across the board that it's people are shocked when uh, it's yeah. brought up that there isn't evidence behind this. And so yeah. it's, 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 it's like psychometric for, you know, it's, it's like psychometric phrenology or astrology. I mean, 
going to an astrologer is appealing. I mean, there's, it's very technical. We might even have gone, but go in there and just say, and, and keep a poker face on and say, you know, tell me about the next five years of my life, next year of my life, next six months, where are things going with love, work, kids, uh, et cetera, and see, and see how it works out, you, you know? Um, and so it's the same thing with trying to figure out a kid. Um, we're doing it post hoc. We're doing it retrospectively. We have information. We're cobbling the pieces together in the same way that an astute astrologer or tarot card reader is doing. Um, so yeah, I mean that's what the that's what the literature suggests. I hate to say that. I love IQ. Um, I love doing the assessments, but the science isn't there. Um, and the thing is that, I mean, we keep buying the assessments. Nobody seems to really care that um, maybe it's not research-based and the companies wouldn't care if they're getting money. And so it's kind of this cycle where <laughs> nothing changes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's most valid and reliable at the full-scale IQ. If you want to venture off into interpretation of the composite, do so only cautiously. There's not much variance there in the same way that the um, – um, you know, what are the gravitational forces on the Earth? It's predominantly the sun like G. And then maybe you have the moon and the other planets. They're there. They're so minuscule in comparison, oh, right, yeah. to, to the <laughs> secondary composites. So, um, you know, that's where you're taking the variance itself. Um, so. Cool. Um, let's see. Yeah, I'm going to. One more question. Sorry. I know, Eric, I think you have something to say, too. But um, what are your suggestions for approaching LD assessments in the fall, considering students have basically been deprived call the education for That's, an entire quarter? You know, that, that is a really, really interesting question. I, I mean, one of the rule outs is lack of educational exposure. And there's been some, at least on uh, websites, I saw one on CNBC, that kids are going to be 50% lower than what they might be given this COVID. Uh, pandemic, the reading and math scores are lower. I, you got, you got to use your judgment. I, I think you have to, um, this, this is where clinical judgment comes into play, um, in these matters. And, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Do you guys have anything else to say? Um, any last comments? I know that our next podcast is on six, seven with, uh, Dr. Vander Hayden to talk about math. Uh, instruction assessment intervention so I'm really excited for that one too yes but. and then we have a special podcast Tuesday night uh, which is what the 19th with yes. Dr. Evelyn Billius Lolas who's been uh, nominated for uh, let's see APA D division 16 chair position and is uh, one of our colleagues in Connecticut so we're looking forward to talking to her and the work she's doing too Mm -hmm. all right yeah, thank you to all the viewers out there and thanks for the kind comments uh, thank uh, you a lot lot to cover but uh you know hopefully it all worked out <laughs> this was great thank you so much yeah. all right take care all right thank you again awesome all right take care see you guys uh -huh.